Thank you, Dean Letts. Thank you, Catherine, for the invitation. I'm truly honored as a mathematician to speak uh, to the wider Lethbridge community. So, um, hi, I'm Habiba, and I have math anxiety and imposter syndrome. I'm a professional mathematician, so this may seem paradoxical. It is actually not that much, and so that's part of what I'm going to tell you about today. Let's see about this here. Tell me if it's, no, no, that's okay. So, in this talk, I'll talk about negative experiences in mathematics that many of us go through. Um, so, how some of us are more affected by those negative experiences than others, and how we can try to heal from these together. In other words, how we can learn to be resilient in mathematics. So first, what is resilience? Okay, let's go open our Oxford Dictionary. The capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. My colleagues in physics, economics, ecology have also their own definition of resilience, of material, in ecology of ecosystems. I kind of like the definition in, in, in ecology. It's the capacity of an ecosystem to respond to changes. And here, as an example, the canal fire in Waterton Parks. On the, okay, on your right? Am I correct? On your left? You see? Uh, <laughs> I'm doing number theory, not geometry. <laughs> so, on your left, this is just after the fire. On the right, this is after prairie flowers like, are uh, thriving on this burnt field. So there is that idea that uh, Nietzsche and you know, Kelly Clarkson share. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, but there is also another collective responsibility here. It's not because the forest has, a capacity, has some resilience capacity that we should go flip away, away matches in the middle of it. So my take on resilience in mathematics, there's two parts. There's the individual part, how we should, we, to be resilient in mathematics means to persist. And in, for the mathematical community, it's to deal with the many challenges that the mathematics community is facing. So um, that resilience would come from realizing that many other mathematicians have faced the same struggles in building confidence in our capacity to recover from multiple challenges and setbacks, in collaborating with different people, in creating spaces that accept and value individuals and their contributions. <coughs> so, to give a bit of context, um, when I was asked to do a talk in mathematics for our Lethbridge community, um, it was 2021, we were still in the COVID crisis, it was after Black Lives Matter, Every Child Matters. We were, in the, as I said, in the COVID-19 pandemic. I was starting some service duties with the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the Canadian Math Society. And so there were a lot of discussions about being a mathematician and at the same time being a citizen of that society and how both, how, how both were merging in my head. So this is this talk today. It's not the talk that I've given before, so I'm very nervous about it. <laughs> um, it is fueled by my personal journey in becoming a mathematician. And as I said, all these discussions and all was what was that whirlwind that was happening at the time. So I'll start by talking about negative experiences in mathematics. So in case you were afraid that these notes in front of you were for pop quiz in math, <sighs> We can relax. <laughs> That's not my point. <laughs> I keep that for your children. <laughs> so, um, first, I want to. Uh, we, I think we should acknowledge that mathematics is very often used as a gatekeeper. Our educational system is full of gates, and mathematics is a simple tool to um, evaluate and address what we estimate are desirable qualities to access STEM careers. I don't know if you can read, can you, are you able to read the slides? Yeah, so you can enjoy math with bad drawings. 
uh, the middle character in particular say, oh, we want the best prepped med, uh, pre-med. I know, calculus too, that makes sense, okay? So, in particular, calculus can leave some trauma for people who want into pre-med or uh, management or law school. Uh, they would have to pass those tests, and if they fail, that's pretty much the end of their dream. So, we have to remember that there can be some stress relied to mathematics being used as a gatekeeper, like here. About a little bit about my experience, another type of gatekeeper is mathematics as a competitive game. So, <coughs> in France, um, there is, if you want to have a best career, you know, secure job, best salary, being part of what you call the elite, uh, you train into preparatory class, it's after high school, it's a competitive entry exam, and it is also quite an intense training. Um, in ter uh, given you like what my schedule were, was looking like at the time, so it's about more than 30 hours of classes, and two-thirds is math and physics. The intensive part is the fact that you have long weekly exams, both written, oral, that you're evaluated, ranked, publicly, that you can be ridiculed for making mistakes, for asking trivial questions, and which, I mean, I think maybe mentality has changed a bit. I, this was my experience. Oh, sorry, I'm going to age myself. <laughs> I have to do the math on the spot. <laughs> 25 years ago. No, more. More than 25 years ago. Anyway, all this to say that um, even if maybe mentalities have changed, there is still that idea that there are some questions you don't ask if you don't want to look stupid, okay? Which is counterintuitive when you are in, educa in educational perspective where, no, you should have a space to ask questions, make mistakes, learn from them, and evolve. And as a professional mathematician, that's what I do, actually. Uh, yeah, I have a little illustration. If you read French, it's in the bubbles, otherwise it's at the bottom. This was actually from one of my math textbooks, so um, a little bit of like the flavor of a math boot camp that <laughs> we were going through. Be, uh, welcome to preparatory class, your lunchbox and mattress is under your bench, you have a right to a minute pee break per week and to an hour at Christmas for dinner with your family. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was competitive. It was amplified, it amplified sexism, incidents of racism and sexism. And at the end of the first year, I was just stripped from my confidence and from the joy that I had originally in doing mathematics. So I turned my back to the elite and I went to the university. <laughs> I mean, you know, in France, that's how it's considered. Um, oh, I think I skipped two at once, sorry. Um, another kind of negative experience here, I'm going to let my colleague Edward Doolittle from First Nations University speak here. This is from an article that he wrote for the Canadian Math Society Notes in March 2020. And he addresses the experience of mathematics in residential schools. Mathematics is how they really got us, said one residential school survivor to me. It seems likely to me... So, uh, Dolittle continues, it seems likely to me that in res residential school, the power of mathematics was misused, as were the other res residential school subjects, as a tool for colonization and repression. The study of that issue is within the domain of mathematics education, but all mathematicians and math educators should be aware of the potential of mathematics to do harm as well as good. In his practice, uh, Professor Doolittle uh, uses ex his expertise in applied mathematics to propose some math research opportunities and applications in indigenous contexts. So he is using mathematics here to bring something positive. Most people may not experience mathematics in such a automatic way, but I think we still should be mindful that it can be, at least it has been. I told you earlier, um, that I had imposter syndrome. To understand, to understand uh, what it is about, I think we have to understand how mathematics is perceived and is perceived as an innate gift. You know, I'm not good at math. I'll never be good at math. I was awful at, you know, the whole thing. 
So this chart, I don't know, would that work? Oh, yeah, okay. Horizontally, here, uh, this is field-specific ability beliefs. So the more you go on this, this way, the higher there's a belief that you need to have brilliance to succeed in that field. Vertically, there, is the rate of a woman um, PhDs in that field. So math is there. Okay, I'm sorry for shaking so much. Uh, <laughs> but it is completely, you know, it is the field that is considered as the one among all the science fields here, or the STEM fields here, for which you need to have the most in, uh, inner gift. Under here, if you're in humanities, you can look where you rank, okay? I'm also happy to share all the, all the resources. But so, you, you are in a field where you have to be good. If you have it, you have it or you don't have it, okay? Um, in particular, you have, you know, Pictures like that that are quite popular uh, in, in my field here. This is Paul Erdosch, who's the most prolific mathematician of the 20th century with over 3,000 paper, papers. <laughs> and here you have child prodigy Terry Tao, 10-year-old, both of them pondering on a math problem. Where does that leave you when you see that picture? Do you feel you can compare to either of them, 3,000 papers, 10-year-old? who has already uh, his master, in, I mean, his PhD, actually his bachelor, I think, at the time. It's like, doesn't leave much room. So, the, imp the imposter syndrome happens when you confront the idea of being a genius with your reality, which is fearing of not being up to the level. If you can't read here, it just says, am I even good enough to have imposter syndrome? <laughs> so, one of the things that I was showing you in the graph earlier was, you know, the rate of female PhDs here. And as you can see, the more you are expected to be brilliant, the lower the rate, okay? So there's a direct correlation here, and that's what that study is, is telling us about. Once you don't believe in yourself, you tend to self-sabotage. So for women uh, considering STEM programs, so what you have here in dark blue is um, the rate of boys who are going to go in a STEM program after high school. And in, pale, in lighter blue is the rate of women. And here this is their grade in high school. So that's under 80%, 80 to 90, over, nine, uh, over 90%. And you can see that, for instance, even women with higher grades than boys here, less of them are going to go in, into high school, into a STEM program, even though they are actually more competent. So, again, like, what do, who, who are mathematicians? Okay, I, I mean, as I said, I'm one, I can show my diplomas. Um, but in the, if you ask in the, normally, I mean, what, what, are the, what are the models of mathematicians that we have? Well, you have Hollywood movies, and you have like story of John Nash in A Beautiful Mind, Alan Turing in The Imitation Game, uh, Srinasav Ramanujan, that's the first person of color here in uh, The Man Who Knew Infinity. And finally, Hidden Figures, one movie for three women, uh, Catherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughan, who were the black female mathematicians whose calculation were uh, essential for the Apollo program. So these models are not really diverse. They are becoming more diverse, okay? But this is not necessarily um, this is not necessarily how you think of a mathematician. You don't necessarily think a black woman. So this is from a study from uh, 2000, and it's done over several countries, five different countries, including U.S., U.K., uh, Romania, Sweden. I forgot the fifth. Again, that's some reference. And these are the findings of that study. Uh, pupils, so uh, children of like um, 12, 13 year olds, so really at an age where you start projecting yourself in the future, what am I gonna do? Uh, this is what they think of mathematicians. Usually they're male, only 3% of boys were drawing a woman mathematician in, in US. Uh, mathematicians have special powers, you know, to understand those weird scribbling. Like, again, the myth of a genius. Mathematicians are authoritarian and threatening, like with that jarring 
uh, drawing, it's not the only one that's kind of like, it makes you anxious, you know, it's triggering. Uh, I think what it reflects a lot is the anxiety that you have when a math prof tells you, seven and three, how much? I'm like, well, I don't know my name, okay? <laughs> so, there's that, and there's also the fact that we transmit our uh, math anxiety. So adults transmit that to children, teachers transmit, transmit that to children. And if you had had a bad experience and you overcame it, overcame it, yeah, um, you don't necessarily make it easier for the other people behind you. It has been my case, okay? I didn't, I had people that obviously had terrible experience with their career and somehow that had to be difficult for everyone. So, let me say a little bit about sexism in mathematics. First of all, in that first picture, this is, I find this is a very nice way, I mean, very speaking way, of explaining that sexism is not only sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is really the tip of the iceberg. The rest that is under, that you don't see, that is things that people have to deal with every day is under the surface. If you don't really comprehend what it means, microaggressions, I recommend this documentary called Picture a Scientist. This is something that, is, um, that has been acclimated in, the, in, um, in, uh, in science in general as welcoming to raising awareness of what are microaggressions looking like, what is sexism and racism looking like in academia, for instance. An example of racism is the case of uh, this young girl, Cra uh, Gracie Cunningham. She's just your average 16-year-old high schooler. Uh, it was summer 2020. She was um, getting ready for school, putting on her makeup. She does a TikTok video, and she's like, when she's putting her foundation, is math is even real? Like, how did people come up with their theorems? How did they know it was true? What tools did they have to verify any of that? Is that real? She posts that, she posts it, goes to bed. Usually she gets a dozen views. Next day she has millions of views, people creating um, websites on her saying she's the dumbest ever, she doesn't know what she's talking about, and she's so dumb. And it's quite violent. She, she gets um, bullied online. The math community has reacted pretty well with it. There's been a lot of important figures that have come up and written publicly everywhere. You should listen. She's actually asking important, relevant questions in mathematics, you know? Um, how do we construct new mathematics? Where, how do we know it's true? All these questions are the essence of mathematics. So, um, you know, just, uh, just another example of, it doesn't matter that you're young, it doesn't matter that you put makeup on, you still can have deep thoughts. But that's kind of um, pressure that you have when you're a young girl, thinking of mathematics, you're not allowed, you know, you're not legitimate. So there is a diversity in ma uh, issue in mathematics, I mean, in science in general, but really in mathematics. Just had to drink and look at that. It's a, it's, it's a slide on the leaky pipeline, so I'm just going to refill the water. <laughs> so what do we call the leaky pipeline? You can imagine you have this flow of water in a leaky pipeline. At the end of, uh, of it, there's not much remaining compared to what you put at the beginning. So this is a description. This is Stats Canada from 20, uh, 2021-2022. Uh, high school women perform equally well as men in mathematics in high school. There's actually more young women, a higher rate of women than men that graduate high school, like of the order of 87 versus 81 percent. Then things start to change when you enroll in a bachelor program. So between non-STEM and STEM fields, men are kind of like divide equally. Then between math intensive and non-math intensive, kind of the same too. There's like a quarter at the end that goes into math intensive STEM uh, programs. For women, there's already a shift between non-STEM and STEM programs. Only 30% of them are going to look into STEM programs. Then when it comes to math intensive, only 5%. So that's quite a dramatic drop here. That reflects in the labor force, you know, jobs in natural applied sciences 
are only occupied by a quarter by women. So there's a, there's a big part of the population that is not appearing in mathematics or math intensive fields. So that includes computer science, physics, engineering, things like that. If you're from other historically marginalized groups, it's even worse. These are stats from US for math. Um, we don't have quite, we don't have those stats um, in Canada. Um, but if you look at Latino Americans, Black, African Americans, Native Americans, Hawaiians, Pacific Islander, you can see every time there is a dramatic drop. Like for Black, Ameri for black Americans, from 12.4% to 2.8%. And that's not even, if you go into looking at the split between women um, and men in Black Americans, that's even less. Okay. So the, the, these challenges that we, that a lot of us experience. Uh, with mathematics disproportionately impact people who are orally marginalized in other ways. Because they are given the message that they don't belong. I'm quoting here uh, Toni Morrison. She actually, I find, gives a very telling image of what racism is about. The function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. This is exhausting. And that can also explain, you know, the attrition. So let's look a little bit at, um, so I'm still talking about the lack of diversity. Well, why would we care? Well, there's good reasons to care. First, duh, that's the right thing to do, okay? If there's inequalities, you should be concerned into doing the right thing. The civic argument, educated people, people with critical thinking are better citizens. They make better decisions, that's important for our democracies. The demographic argument, it, build, it builds trust between communities and, leader, and between communities and leadership. We can think of lack of trust during the COVID time. Uh, the economic argument, to diminish economic gaps and tensions in, the in different communities, that's an argument. The two last arguments maybe we don't hear enough about is the performance argument, which is that companies who have more diverse workforces perform actually better, like 30% better than average. And the academic argument, which is that in being around people who are different from us, it makes us more creative, more diligent, and harder working. What do the mathematicians have to say about that? Well, uh, you remember that 10-year-old boy, that child prodigy? He, is, he was called, and he's called still, the uh, math Mozart. Uh, he has received all the accolades that you can imagine of as a mathematician, in particular, like the Fields Medal. And this is what he says about mathematics and what we should, how we should think about it. It's also good to remember that professional mathemati mathematics is not a sport. The objective of mathematics is not to obtain the highest ranking, the highest score, or the highest number of prizes and awards. Instead, it is to increase understanding of mathematics, both for yourself and for your colleagues and for your students, and to contribute to its development and applications. For these tasks, mathematics needs all the good people it can get. I think that message needs to be amplified. There is a raising awareness in the mathematical community about how we need to address the lack of diversity. So this is a report from the American Math Society from 2021. And these are the findings. Racism is a concern for many mathematicians. Discrimination affects black mathematicians' visibility and the perceptions of their work. The lack of recognition hinders their professional advancement. Black mathematicians suffer from lack of professional respect and endure microaggressions. Implementing sustainable change is challenging, and it requires intentionality and continual vigilance. At the national level, we have uh, our Chief Science Advisor of Canada, uh, Dr. No Mona Nimmer, who um, says essentially that the status quo is not a solution. 
and increasing the number and impact of women and other members of underrepresented groups in STEM requires the concerted efforts of our entire society, including government, um, governments, scientific organizations, research granting agencies, and educational institutions. So we have a collective uh, responsibility, and I want to go into the more positive aspects here. How do we build resilience in mathematics? Now that I've kind of, I don't know, put the moral down a little bit. <laughs> um, let's see the, what we can do. So first, let's acknowledge that mathematics is everywhere. And when you think of, um, there was this comment that one of the kids said about mathematicians are useless. I think one of them even said, nobody's dumb enough to hire a mathematician. Uh, <laughs> Oops, uh, there's a lot of people that hire mathematicians. And you can make careers that at first doesn't sound like there's any mathematics in it. For instance, cancer research. Okay? Um, we have all these big data that we are constructing with you know, clinical trials, um, um, some cancer imaging archives. You apply math modeling to that, and then you have the ability to run experiments virtually that that spares a lot of money and a lot of time, so we can go faster, more efficient, cheaper, because of math. Um, some other examples, so if, I, I don't know how many um, people have suffered mathematics in university, but <laughs> <laughs> linear algebra, topology, statistics, probability, uh, graph theory, all these have applications in things as diverse as medical imaging, big data, agriculture, health services, um, linguistic, molecular chemistry. I mean, seriously, I, there's a lot of choice. So I think it's, it's an important message, especially when you're younger and you want to be useful and you like mathematics and hopefully if people don't uh, um, mistreat you for having that desire, you should be nurtured into that, that path because you can be useful using mathematics. Um, here, so I told you, I, 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 I started thinking about what am I going to talk about, okay? Yes, I can talk about the zeros of a Riemann zeta function, but I can give you links to my videos when I do these talks. <laughs> and I can, at the time, I was really thinking, well, I was quite impressed by uh, the mathematicians that were producing the models uh, to predict how the evolution of uh, the spread of COVID-19 could happen. And in particular, the team, the BC team, so led by Caroline Collin, who was actually advisor on the national COVID-19 uh, scientific developments. Um, they were the, the SEER models that they were uh, producing were amazing of accuracy. So, in the midst of that craziness, it was, there was some kind of reassurance to know that people, if you were doing certain things, in particular here, uh, she's known for um, um, one of her famous papers about how keeping distance, you know, has direct impact on contact rates in population. I mean, we all know that now, <laughs> but it's thanks to research of her team. So, I felt mathematics can help us recover from this kind of trauma that we went through. If you listen to mathematicians a little bit, at least they tell you, if you do this, that happens, don't be surprised. Uh, fun fact, uh, Caroline Collin, so who is, as I said, a national um, figure, uh, has some relation to Lethbridge. I was very surprised, like, what? <laughs> um, her, her mom was a philosophy professor, I think, for a year or two here, so. Oh, too fast. Okay. okay, I was just mentioning some application that is close to my research. Um, as uh, Dean Lett said earlier, I do number theory. And, okay, I wasn't going to show you my equations, but I was going to tell you, think about mathematics as being at the roots of a lot of uh, technologies. And number theory is at the roots here of building, um, you know, the best quantum resistant algorithm and crypto system to keep your internet secure. I can tell you a tiny bit 
about why, because still I'm a mathematician, I still should say one mathematical thing, no? Isn't it what you came for? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the objects that originally people have been playing with, prime numbers, these are objects that I, you can, I can, exp can I explain it to my daughter? Hmm. <laughs> they are whole numbers, and they only are divisible by themselves and by one. So if you take two, two is divisible by two and one, three is one, it's another prime number, four, ah, two by two is four, not a prime. Uh, what's after five? Five, only one and five divides five, that's a prime. Six, no, two and three, okay. So you can continue like that, okay? Um, why we're interested in them? Because you can reconstruct any number with prime numbers. Think about it as your Legos, okay? And you construct whatever you want with it. So that's the original interest into prime numbers. We're talking like centuries old interest. At the time, they had no clue about crypto system. Let's be very clear, okay? The difficulty about prime numbers is that if you take a really, really large integer, think like hundreds and hundreds of digits, you know, it feels like several pages, and you're being asked, okay, find the prime divisors demanding that. So there's a bit of stress. <laughs> and uh, currently, uh, our computer capability, it's going to take hundreds of years. So you have the time to do your order on Amazon, you're safe. Okay? And this is coming because we don't know enough. You know, this is a challenge with prime numbers. This seems very simple, but uh, it's very, very hard to crack them. So what I do, the research that I'm interested in, and when I talk about resilience, why you know, did I reconnect at some point with mathematics when it seemed such a terrible experience? Um, so I went to university, and at some point, I think I, in 1997, I can't remember the month, the day, or the hour, but um, I learned that there's a connection between prime numbers and another field of mathematics that I had studied completely independently, which is called harmonic analysis. Calculus, calculus, but like really on steroid, like very powerful. And these two fields that are completely unrelated at first sight, okay, they are developed at different times for different purposes, actually there's a connection. And when you find an unexpected connection, it's like, what? Why? Okay, and that piques your interest. So Seeing unexpected, you know, connections, it reinforced my interest in mathematics here. I'm sorry, I want to look to show you that slide. So here, on, the, on, on wherever my pointer is, this is to show you, this is just a picture of, it's representing prime numbers, but what I want to say, like, there's some regularity in prime numbers, and that regularity, the laws that are kind of governing these numbers, can be explained through other laws in harmonic analysis. Another thing maybe I did not tell you about harmonic analysis is that it's the same tools that we use to uh, study to understand sound waves. So there's a, um, I think it's Bombieri, another ma famous mathematician that's, that quoted this, like he calls it like the music in the primes. You know, there's these two, um, yeah, the music here <laughs> and the primes there. If you want to know exactly what I'm picturing, I'll be happy to, to tell you about it. But uh, that's uh, this, this connection was mesmerizing. If you're doing a number theory, and what I, what I do specifically, analytic number theory, and even if you don't, if you're a mathematician, there's, there's a, f a handful of, like, they are considered like the most important conjectures, like open problems in mathematics. And uh, the, there's one in our field, it's called the Riemann hypothesis. It's, uh, there's an award of $1 million associated to it that would be given by the Clay Mathematical Institute to whoever solves a problem. It's a conjecture that's over 160 year old, it's like a graal for mathematicians. Uh, but to be quite honest, you can become richer as a mathematician than trying to solve this, okay? <laughs> So, another aspect of mathematics that is positive is the notion of beauty. I don't know if you ever heard about that before, but I can tell you about my experience with it. So, when I, when I was an undergrad, um, I had this, this class with this professor. I'm, I'm citing his name because, you know, you should analyze the people that have mattered. 
uh, Michel Mendes France. And um, the way he was delivering his lecture, the way he was doing what, you know, proofs in mathematics was actually quite fascinating. It seemed so natural, so elegant. There was not any other way to think about it somehow. And that's, that's the other part of mathematics that I kept my interest, was that storytelling, you know, being able... Because there's lots of ways to prove a result, to establish some truth. But when you can do it with the minimum amount of effort, with elegance, that's really fascinating. So that's, that's, that I was lucky to have that experience, and that kept me engaged. It was also someone who was also a wonderful human being. He loved poetry, he liked drawing. Um, I thought as a tongue-in-cheek I would show you uh, one of his drawings from his poetry book called uh, Mathema Pure Mathematics Don't Exist. See, Gracie? People agree. Um, and the notion of uh, beauty in mathematics here is also quoted by Paul Erdos, you know, that I mentioned to you earlier. He says, he, he had this idea that, you know, the most those, beauty, those beautiful proofs would be all in a book, you know, that God had, whether you believe or not in God. And when you are able to perceive one of his proofs, you know, like this is a proof from a book, that would be how he would describe beauty. It's like there is somewhere this perfect proof. So having people see beaut the beauty in mathematics will make mathematics seem a little bit less daunting. Another one, pleasure in mathematics. That one that I think any w a lot of people can relate. A lot of people are paying money to solve puzzles. Why do we do that? Why do we spend time, like, you know, trying to figure out, like, you know, this thing? Well, because there's a rush of excitement when you find it, okay? And as a mathematician, where you, like, try to crack puzzles, when you are able to go through, you get that rush of excitement. And it keeps you engaged, it keeps you curious and motivated, and you want to go further. That's, oops, that's something that, you know, actually some team of neuroscientists have uh, narrowed down. When you have that aha moment, uh, you actually have a, a rush of dopamine, you know? So that's where you want to continue. Even if, like, you, like, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. Oh, it works. Another way of, you know, finding resilience is starting to see yourself in other mathematicians. So one of the things I was telling you earlier was the problems, like, with the stereotypes and how we don't see diverse faces, you know, people who are of different gender, different sexuality, different... Um, races, different abilities. Um, we don't have that wide array. And so here, I'm showing you some various math associations. They are not, this is not an exhaustive list, but you can see there's association for women, for Latinx, here created by uh, Pamela Harris, um, mathematically gifted and black, the Society of, Advance of Advancement for Chicanos, Hispanics, Native Americans, Center for Minorities in the Mathematical Sciences, Spectra for LGBTQ plus um, mathematicians, here with two figures, Ron Buckmeyer in the US and Anthony Bonato here um, in Canada. So having relatable role models allows one to see oneself as a mathematician. Um, to tell you a little bit about my story, when I arrived in Lethbridge, very early I was invited to the first, in, the first instance of um, what is called Women in Numbers, WIN in short. Uh, and these workshops, so it was an all-women workshop, and the idea was to put together in teams a mix of senior and younger researchers to work on projects. So you would go, it's in Bath, so it's wonderful, and um, you work on these math projects with all these other women that you've never seen before, that you, did not, that you always felt like you go in a room and you're like the only girl, you know, it's like, and suddenly there's a room full of them. So there is somehow like that kind of weight lifted, <laughs> you know. And um, so this, uh, this, pro this program was so popular, so it continued. And then other um, 
fields of mathematics besides number theory started imitating it. And so then now there's a lot of sister networks like the woman in shape, wish, the woman in topology, wit, and so forth. And um, this, this is actually um, another uh, local uh, acknowledgement here. One of the organizers, oh, since I have that green thing, is here. It's Renate Scheidler. She's a, she's a colleague in Calgary. And so, as I said, this has spread out all over the world. It's the same in Europe, and it started just next door. And if you want to know where I am, this fresh face is up here. <laughs> and what I like in that picture is that at the time, there was a mix of undergrad, grad, you know, senior researchers. And the youngest, they stayed in the field. They are now leaders in, uh, in our field. So having people working collaboratively instead of competitively makes it e easier to overcome difficulties. Uh, locally here, I wanted to share with you some of the faces that I've worked on problems before. So all these people have suffered with me. And that's another thing. It's easier to suffer in teams, you know, <laughs> than alone. <laughs> so um, there is undergrads, grads, postdocs, colleagues, uh, husband, <laughs> there. <laughs> and um, yeah, one of the things that I can tell you, very often I've struggled, or even with some of my collaborators, like on problems, and it is, uh, we're kind of stuck. And then we're bringing in a student or a postdoc, and it's like, it forces you to re-explain some things, to think about the problem differently, and that's often how you actually get through. So that, and it's also like you get someone who's getting excited about the problem with you, uh, that, and on something that, you know, was old in your drawers, and it's like, I don't know how to go from it. But then you have some new blood, and they're like excited, and then you go through. And so for, for the pictures of the people I'm showing here, uh, I've, we've gone through, you know, we've struggled through problems for some time, and then bringing some new people have actually helped to produce wonderful, I mean, I think, result. At least I was very happy to do all that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to single out Elisa here, because she's born and raised in Lethbridge, and she's now um, assistant professor at York University. So, um, but all of them were actually wonderful people to work with. And there's some new ones on the corner over there. <laughs> um, OK, another thing that I want to acknowledge is that mathematical institutes, like earlier Mona Nehmer talked about you know, how we need, everybody needs to do something. So I'm going to talk about uh, the PIMS Institute, Pacific, Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences, who is a consortium of a lot of universities on the West Car Western Canada and, and, um, and uh, Washington. And so they do reward projects that would advance not only your field, so, you know, proposing research projects, but also doing something for the community. So in terms of training, in terms of elevating other researchers with an open goal of improving um, the, the, the inclusivity and, inclusion and the diversity in the teams that you're building. So... What I, 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 I thought maybe finish with some takeaways, okay? Building resilience in mathematics. So, first, we have to accept that making mistakes, it's part of a process for learning and doing mathematics. As I said, I started in an environment that was stigmatizing you for doing any mistakes. But actually, it's the opposite. You have to acknowledge your mistakes and then move on and learn and accept that next time you'll do a mistake, the more you do, the more you build confidence to actually face those mistakes instead of turning your back. And that's how progress and discoveries are made. So building confidence by persisting in that process is a very empowering experience. I think that's what mathematics has taught me. Reaching out, collaborating with diverse people boosts creativity. Again, that has been my experience, and, I, and it, it is the experience of a lot of um, my mathematician's colleague. Breaking the stereotypes. This is just a waste of time. Personally, I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> changing, but can changing the culture is my responsibility, but all of us, you know, as parents, as educators, um, the friends of your kids, like everyone, you know, we have to break the stereotypes. Everybody is allowed to do mathematics, struggle, and enjoy it. 
oops, sorry. F um, appreciating the contribution of mathematics to our life and society. I think it makes it less of a mystery if you actually understand that there's so many places where there is hidden mathematics and not so hidden. Exposing the new generations to diverse role models, building mentorship through high school and secondary education. And I would say, now that I'm a bit on the senior side, I appreciate the mentorship from even older uh, <laughs> of, of my colleagues, okay? And actually, I also appreciate, I, if I think of role models, I find also a lot of role models in, my, in the younger generation. So there's a lot of resources that mathematical associations and societies are putting at the disposition of communities. So if you want, you know, go knock on the door of our math department and ask, you know, what are you doing? And the university is doing wonderful outreach. You know, be aware of it and take advantage of it. Um, building, reinforcing support networks, um, increase feelings of belonging, opportunities and retainment. And I know in my case, that has helped to not turn my heels away. I'm finishing with something very mathematical, which is if you want to create a new theory, <laughs> You have to have new axioms. Axioms is a mathematical word. It, word. It's a word to say, we start from here, and then through the rest, we're going to build from it. This is the foundation. These are words from a Colombian colleague, Federico Ardila. OK, I'm just worried because I'm going to try to speak Spanish. Nadie te quita lo bayado. I, I liked, I liked his, this citation. You know why? Because it says, nobody can take from you what you've already danced. And when you do mathematics and you go through this struggle, the pleasure, the reward that you have to have created something, to have overcome something, is yours. And whatever anybody else tells you, they can take that away from you. So these are some axioms. Um, I don't know if everyone can read it. Maybe I can finish on that. I don't know how I'm doing about time, so you can absolutely get the hook of play the music, but um, these are the axioms. Mathematical potential is distributed equally among different groups, irrespective of geographic, demographic, and economic boundaries. Everyone can have a joyful, meaningful, and empowering mathematical experience. Mathematics is a powerful, malleable tool that can be shaped and used differently by various communities to serve their needs. And finally, every student, everyone, deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you.